So, good morning. Um, thank you very much again uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, uh, dear Rector Savatanik, also uh, other rectors and members of the Rectors Conference here in Slovenia, dear colleagues. Um, I have the chance today to present some ideas we've been developing on the future of higher education, um, which we've developed for the German government, but with an international outlook. Um, and um, interestingly enough, I, I'm presenting this as a piece of research, but you'll see already um, here it says I'm a senior researcher at Kieron Open Education. Um, the Kieron platform is a way of, is, is a way of providing uh, digital learning to help refugees get into higher education. And this is a little bit of my idea that uh, after I've developed this kind of study on what the future should look like, I'd like to get my hands dirty and try and make the future happen. Um, just maybe one thing on this picture you see here on the, um, on the right hand side. Um, I was stuck very recently in uh, Mannheim um, because my train was delayed and often if I get stuck in a city I like to see if there's a university nearby and just pop in and see what it's like. The really interesting thing is above, this, above the ceiling here in the picture was an auditorium where there was a lecture going on and there were hardly any students in that lecture. Underneath here in this space it was totally full of students working with each other. And I think this is one of the things that uh, we have to think in higher education about how students are learning now, because things are changing already. And otherwise, we're going to miss some of these changes. And um, so this was really one of the ideas behind uh, the study we did for the German government. And also, just to tell you, when I arranged to do this talk uh, months ago, I had presumed that the study I'm going to present to you would have been released months ago. In fact, the official release date is today. So um, yesterday I did an interview on uh, German radio. Uh, this morning there's at least one article in uh, the German newspapers about this study. So this is really fresh and hot off the press for you. So. I'll come back a little bit to this idea that we um, have used games to talk about what the future of higher education might be like. Um, but I already think that um, this idea is quite nice, which is often when we think of higher education, um, we're thinking very much of a closed space. Normally, it's the campus. In fact, if we're thinking of digital learning, we often think of this being the, um, the screen in front of the student and maybe something behind it. Um, this is rather a closed idea of education, and so we'll come on later um, today on what the uh, further ideas could be. But it's this idea, well, does this really work for students? And in fact, is this really how students are working? So very often when I talk to policymakers, um, they presume that um, students are all working um, on their studies full time, they only focus on studies. But we know for research, from research for the last 20 years, this isn't the case. Students study a long time, alongside doing many other things, and it's going to be more and more important to recognize this, and I'll come on to that. We have a double challenge now. We have to think about our students learning or acquiring the right skills for the future in a digital environment. And we also have to think about how can we make um, learning more flexible by thinking of new pathways through learning. And just one of the studies which is being um, produced at the moment on the future of higher education, I thought was quite useful. This is something coming from the UK. Um, the main point about this study where they're talking about solving future skills challenges is they say we have to get away from the linear model of understanding that um, a young person finishes school, goes to university, says, I'm finished with university, and works. We're moving more and more away from that, but also if we start moving away from that idea, we can also make higher education more inclusive as well. 
just really because I want to go through these a little bit quickly, the slides will be available to you afterwards as well, but just really to show we are already seeing changes in the skills demands on the labor market. And if you just look here, this is an analysis that has, done, has been done by the OECD. And all you really have to look at is um, this top level here of um, the skills, written expression, written comprehension, deductive reasoning. They're, according to their analysis, that's where the skills gaps are at the moment in the labor market. Now, you will recognize those because really they're what we're often calling 21st century skills. So it's about having digital and information literacy. It's about being creative and it's about developing collaborative skills. So we have to ask ourselves, are we offering within higher education an environment which promotes this kind of skills? If we look, um, there's a lot of studies at the moment or changes that are going to happen in the labor, labor market. I just want to give uh, one indication of this study and just one particular thing here which says about a third of people in the labor market at the moment in countries such as Germany are going to have to change their occupation um, between now and 2030. So the question is how can we make that happen and how can higher education promote that happening. Uh, the big change with uh, digitalization and moving to what we call in Germany at least Industry 4.0 is that in fact the skills demands on people are actually going up. Um, and so we really have to re go back and think about what is learning, how can we create learning environments which can really be inclusive and can help everyone, particularly these people who are, who are going to have to make changes in their career. And if you see this, you see that it's right, that we can't think of a purely linear way of going through an education system, which is what we tend to do at the moment. And here just, again, an indication to say um, what I'm going to be presenting to you is not something that we've developed on our own, but there are lots of other studies at the moment which are really thinking about this kind of learning pathway. Um, this is one of them where they're essentially saying that there's going to be certain periods in somebody's life where because of technical developments, but not only that, also social developments, they're going to need an additional period of learning. So the study um, I'm talking about today is called uh, AHEAD. Um, it's a study for the German government. Um, we have um, a small um, English language uh, summary. We're hoping in the not too distant future to have an English language version of the study, um, but it hasn't been possible at the minute. Um, the most important thing is we were asked really to look forward to 2030 to say how we thought higher education might look given digital developments. And in fact, the ministry, so our client, was a little bit surprised when we said, okay, we're not going to focus on digital first. Firstly, we're going to think about the thing we really know is going to change, which is learners' pathways. Then we're going to think about how digitalization can promote that and can help that. And um, they were a little bit surprised because they expected a more of a kind of a digital technical type study, but in fact, they're already talking about this as being much more useful for them. And so this is why we particularly focused on putting the learner first, and the other thing we did by putting the learner first is we firstly ignored the question of what will the institution university look like. Most foresight studies focus on that. And that is a mistake because as soon as you do that, you get to the big questions like how are we going to fund it, how it will quality assurance be organized, how are we going to regulate the system. These are all important questions, but we should come to them second and not uh, they shouldn't be the first focus. Focus first should be on the learner. So here are um, the four pathways we've developed, and then in a minute I'll talk about the individual models. Um, as you can see um, here, 
the first model we've called Tamagotchi. So we gave all the four models uh, uh, the name of a, uh, a toy. This is a little bit just because we thought it's easy to remember. It's just also a bit of fun. But the, an, the analogies work relatively well. Um, but here the idea is, this is our classic system. I'll talk about it a, a, a bit in a minute. But really, this is our classic idea, which uh, the student, they uh, leave school. And what you see here is this block. They do one block of learning. At the moment, this is in most countries, the bachelor and the master's, that's the block. Then they leave higher education and they say, finish. And I can tell you, my daughter is currently finishing her master's. Um, I was just helping her with, her, with rereading her thesis um, just yesterday. She thinks she lives in this model. I'm trying to tell her that's not the case, you know, because changes will happen. But this is, it's, it's to do with the way we've built the system. So even the young people are still thinking that in this type of model. So the three other models are kind of looking at this idea, but really breaking up the pathway. The first model is called Jenga. The idea with Jenga, um, you'll see a picture of the toy a minute as well, in case you don't know some of these toys. The idea with Jenga is this first block of higher education could be shorter. And we can talk about that in a minute. Um, and then, though, it already assumes that further blocks of higher education will come along the line during a person's lifespan. The third model you won't be surprised about, we've called Lego. It's really quite a different model where it's lots of different blocks of learning. Again, I'll talk about it in a bit more detail in a minute. The fourth model doesn't look as radical as it actually is. The reason is because we don't treat it as radical as it is. We have lots of um, countries which have been working on providing higher education for mature learners. And here, this block we have at the beginning, this is the, uh, the person has um, uh, left school. They most probably have gone into vocational education and they've worked for a period. They could have gone into higher education, that's another possibility, but then they come to this new block of higher education with a whole bunch of experiences and knowledges and we often just ignore that and we treat the mature learners as if they're in the first model. And this is why this model is actually highly relevant as well. So let's just walk very briefly through the models. So this is the Tamagotchi model. Now, um, let me just talk about four aspects which I'll talk about for each of them. The idea here um, is that tertiary education is a fundamental way of learning skills and knowledge which makes the graduate future-proof. This is often discussed when we talk about graduate attributes. There is an implicit, implicit assumption that during this period you've learned many, many skills which make you highly adaptable, which means that if your career does change, you can adapt to that based on what you've learned already in, in, in tertiary education. And this does work. The question is, does it work for enough people? And will it continue to work into the future? And as you know, the, one of the classic problems with this model is we're always confronted by the labor market saying, there are skill gaps. Because what I want as, a, as an employer is not what the university is providing. And this is a little bit to do with the fact of the idea that it's one block and then you're done. So um, in the didactics here, this is a very good model for young people who need a lot of support, who need orientation. So this idea of whole, whole idea of building an ecosystem, having students on campus, making them feel um, a certain identity as part of the university. This is useful for a lot of students. Um, but the didactical model essentially is built on this idea that um, it's enclosed. We help the student to kind of um, uh, develop their initial um, personality and skills which will help them into the future. The technology here, 
Normally, when we talk about technological change at the moment and digitalization, it's always being applied to this kind of model. So this is when we see people saying, OK, we're doing blended learning. We're also um, uh, introducing certain aspects of augmented reality, perhaps, and simulations. But you often find, and this is not just the case in Germany, that this is happening mostly by individual champions in universities who are pushing these things. But it's very hard to um, develop that on a strategic national, uh, strategic institutional scale. So the technology will be changing over the past, uh, over the next uh, 10 to 12 years, for sure. Um, but yesterday in the radio, one of the, my major points was we need to be more experimental. And with this model, it's a little bit difficult to be experimental because we're not really changing the organizational structure. So if we then go forward uh, to Jenga, now um, you can see here almost a didactical process happening here on the right. So Jenga, if you don't know it, it's, it's about building this kind of tower. And the point of this is our idea here is the different colors are kind of different subject areas or diff different knowledge blocks which are being put together. But you can see here partly what we're saying is maybe not everything has to be done in this first block. And then you can also see here once the tower is built, then we start taking some things out because we say they can be learned later. So the idea behind this model is to try and think about what is the thing that's really fundamentally important in a study. Maybe we can do this uh, also in two-year courses. So short cycle programs are certainly growing throughout Europe. The most important thing, though, for this uh, model is that when we think of didactics and we think of program design, the best way to think about it within this model would be to think about the, the final end piece. What does the whole program look like? So, the concept here is you have a short period, which could be those two years, but the whole program is maybe in total five years, but it may take many, many years until all of that is put together. So the interesting thing is here, what role will universities play in this? Because these extra blocks, they can be offered by other providers, but it could be that the university is the one that accredits what's being learned in different phases. Then we have um, the Lego model. I think many people in future studies have talked about this kind of idea, where essentially it's lots of different kind of modules of learning, and it's really, um, in a way, kind of the, the, the... So if we see those are the modules, and then we see building kind of bridges between the different modules. Essentially, the question is, in this model, who is building these bridges? Who's making those connections? Now. If we just say this is the learner, because the interesting point with the Lego idea is the learner is in control, but if we say it's only the learner doing this, what we will find is this is a very exclusive system. Because this is a system which has huge amounts of expectations on the kind of didactical proficiency of an individual student. Because it assumes that the student can make all these connections. Um, so really, here it's a question of could we have some kind of auxiliary services, also this could be provided by universities, which are offering advice on how to make these different connections. And um, what we find is this is happening a little bit already in the job market, especially in areas where um, new skills are being um, expected all of the time, and the university system hasn't really caught up with it. A good example um, from the past in Germany has been um, in computer science, because we realized very quickly in Germany, maybe about 10 years ago, we have a huge gap in the skills of, um, on, the, on the market in terms of uh, IT skills. So the first thing that happened is a very much kind of informal way of organizing the whole thing, where students would be doing various courses and employers would say, okay, well, I, I see how that all fits together, I'll take you on. What's happened in Germany is this has become more formalized. And in fact, this whole kind of flexibility has now become less and less flexible because everyone saw this as a temporary model. And the question is, is this a temporary model or is it for certain areas a very important model? Um, 
But again, of course, here we have the question of how do we assure quality? How do we uh, make sure that we steer the system in a certain way? We need employers to be playing a big role in this model. So uh, uh, there's a huge interaction, I think, between employers and higher education providers here. Um, and we have to make sure that this system isn't wholly exclusive because we need to understand part of didactics is supervision and advice, which tends to be part of our didactics also in the classroom, but it tends to be something we just assume, but we don't focus on. And the more we think about more flexible models, the more we have to think of part of didactics is this advice piece. So the final model I mentioned uh, is Transformer, and this is the idea of kind of, you know, empowerment or awaking someone later uh, in their career. The, as I've said before, um, firstly, this is going to be um, highly important. We have had huge expansion of participation in higher education over the last 20 years, but higher education is still exclusive. We still have very few people um, who come from first, who are first generation students. So it tends to be a great predictor of whether you go to university, of whether your parents have been to university before. This is not going to work in a digital world where the skills demand on individual people are, are going up. We need to rethink about this. And also we need to think about the fact that often we think of this kind of change in later life as something that can be done with further education. There is almost no country in the world where further education is thought of systematically. It's often very fragmented. It's not really governed by, um, by systematic policy. And so we have to think about how we can deal with that. And one of our arguments is, let's pull that into tertiary education or into higher education. So let's, let's try and get away from the idea that higher education is one thing and further education is something else. But we pull that in together, which will mean, of course, we have more diversity, but it will mean we can support this kind of empowerment process, which is important. So we see this happening, that people are coming to higher education over the age of uh, 30 in many countries, but the group is too small. And also, in terms of didactics, I've already mentioned it, it's not really thought in the way of let's learn and let's use the experience and knowledge that these people have brought with them. Because that's the amazing thing about this group of students. So finally, um, really just this is, you know, ever, seeing everything from the, 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 the learner perspective in a certain way. Um, but now we have to think about, well, how could we actually move forward? And of course that means we have to think about the institution or the provision of higher education. And um, so we've said now the changes which are happening is we are looking at changes in the knowledge and competency required on the labor market. We see changes in technology which in terms of labor market change is creating new profile demands, but technology can also be used to provide and support some of the processes in higher education, which I've already mentioned. Demography, of course, right across Europe and, and, and beyond is a huge issue. We have less young people, which means we must anyway move beyond the idea that students are those who are 18 to 22. That's just not sustainable anymore. And the job market is also becoming much more dynamic. More people are working uh, freelance, more people are on smaller contract, shorter contracts. So this dynamism has to be built into the way we think of learners. The way to think of that in terms of how can you build a strategy for higher education, um, I think we can um, look at the work from a study I did with Martin Weller and Rob Farrow, which we called OFAT. Um, in this study, we said if you look at higher education, you can actually just say it's really a connection of three key processes. The first one is the question of um, what is, how do you provide access and delivery of learning opportunities? So the classic idea is, well, you do that by saying a student has to come to your campus. And if we think of an online version, you say, well, you do that by saying the student has to enroll on to an online platform. 
The second point is um, learning content. So what is the content that's being provided for this learning opportunity? And a very important point, which I think we haven't focused on enough, is recognition and certification. So there's a lot happening in this area at the moment. I would say more of the focus is on certification rather than recognition, because we tend to think of we're just assess things, whereas I've already mentioned, particularly with the group of transformers, it's about recognizing what they can already do and building on this. So if we think of that, I think that's a very helpful way to look at the processes we have in our universities and, and in each of these three areas to think about what are we doing and what could we, we be doing to help the learners who are our target group. When we do this, and this is my final slide, we always have to go back to the question of what are our real goals in higher education, especially going forward. And so I think these four things are probably central. We have to say we need to en ensure that students are acquiring new skills and competencies. I've written acquire rather than learn because learn seems to be more of a kind of a asymmetrical process where I teach, somebody learns. I think acquire is maybe more of a process where you can acquire it also through informal learning. Um, study programs need to reflect on and react to developments in society. So I focused in my presentation now very much on labor market demands, but we have other challenges in society as well. Uh, a great way of thinking of these challenges is to think of the sustainable development goals from the UN. Um, and it's a huge importance for higher education that it is a space to reflect on react and react to these because um, it should be a place, and this is my third point, it should be a place where young people and old people, anyone who's learning in higher education, has the opportunity to almost practice future social reform. Higher education is a special space of learning where we can kind of think about how should society continue to develop. And uh, finally, I would say it's about creating and recognizing new learning spaces. And this is really going back to my very first slide where I'm saying, well, that university in Mannheim thinks everyone's sitting in the auditorium, but they're sitting under the auditorium and they're all working together. If we think about this, this also helps universities because one of the things about think going forward, thinking about digitalization, is that universities often say, well, yes, but we need to buy all this equipment to make sure that we can offer augmented reality, um, different kind of additive manufacturing, etc." One way of solving that is to collaborate, for example, with fab labs, to collaborate with firms which are offering these kind of things. So the university doesn't have to offer only things within its kind of own space within its campus, but it can go out and use these learning spaces as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Orr, for, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, yeah, I'm really keen to start learning again. <laughs> um, so if anyone would like to, to ask anything, Professor Orr, please. Otherwise, I have many questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I really like... Um, the terminology which uh, you are using, you don't use the term student, but you're uh, saying that uh, we need to think about learners. So this means that we actually don't think about the student the period from, I don't know, 18 to 24, but uh, we all need to think about our education for, for the longer period. Um, here, most of people are coming from the university, but uh, what, what's your opinion about uh, the beginning of this kind um, of, of learning? Um, 
do you think that this type of learning should start, I don't know, in kindergarten um, or later? Right. So, um, firstly, thank you for picking up on the terminology. There's two things um, we were very keen on in the study. The first is to, uh, as much as possible, to use the term learner instead of student, because it's always a question, well, how do you get the status of student? And that could be, it's normally some kind of administrative process, like enrollment, and we wanted to think kind of, let's think a bit more, um, uh, more flexibly about that. And the second point is, um, we don't talk about, in the study, we don't talk about universities or colleges. So we don't talk about the institution, we talk about higher education. And um, this goes back, for me, a little bit to a book written um, about 20 years ago from a professor um, from the UK, which, is where, which he um, entitles The Idea of Higher Education. And this was a big change because mostly when we're thinking about higher education, we've always had the classic books called The Idea of the University. And so this is why we focus very much on higher education because we're thinking the next question is how to organize that. The, 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 the big question for us, and that's why I kind of had the final slide, is if we're thinking that flexibly, when do we know something is higher education? So this is a bit to your point that if we think of you know, 21st century skills, which at the moment are very much dis discussed on s in secondary education level, um, then we have to think about, well, which kind of level um, should, should students be learning at? Uh, um, the idea of experimenting, being creative, thinking about how society could be in the future, this has to, of course, start uh, in the kindergarten, has to uh, uh, be uh, available in school as well, and in university. But you will see in most debates when we're talking about these new demands, particularly when we're talking about 21st century skills and, and digital, we're always focusing on the new generation. And what about the rest of us? I mean, I'm also not the new generation, you know? And most of us, we finished... Um, some kind of education, let's say when we were mid-twenties or thirties, what about all the rest of the time? So um, I think it's important, of course, to think about the new challenges um, in terms of what should we be changing in the schooling system, but I think higher education has got such a huge responsibility because actually higher education is covering everyone from, let's say, the age of twenty onwards. And Sometimes we don't think about that because we focus too much on the 18 to 22 year olds. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Uh, I noticed that um, you mentioned also in, uh, employers, that these should also influence uh, the system. Do you have any idea how to actually implement this? How, how do you do this in Germany, for instance? So this is a, this idea that um, employers and, and higher education providers should be working f much closer together is really mostly to do with the debates we see all the time in the newspapers where universities are being criticized and not providing what the employers want. My opinion is the labor market has become lazy. They just say, education should be providing everything and then we just want everyone to be perfect and then we put them in a job and they work. That doesn't work in a learning society either. Everyone is part of a learning society, including the employers. We're beginning to have this change. So one of the uh, examples we provide in our study is um, a very big bank uh, based in Norway. They have 10,000 employers, uh, employees, sorry. And um, for their, their current strategy, they have um, four columns of um, how they want to move forward. One of those columns is skills enhancement. And what they've realized is it's becoming very difficult to use the old way of uh, human resources, which is essentially, okay, my business is changing, and of course in banking, things are changing very fast now. The old idea is my business is changing, now I have a gap, I need um, uh, people with a certain skills profile to fill this gap. 
Um, so in banking, banking has become much more about data analysis, for example, and offering data-supported services. In the past, you would just say, right, let's just do an advert for this and let's try and recruit, as I've said, a kind of ready-made person. The banks have realized, and the DMB specifically, this is super expensive and it's a waste of the people I've already, I'm already employing. So they're focusing on skills development and they're doing this by working with educational providers. The disappointing part of this story is they found that the universities have been the least flexible partners. So they've actually started developing something which only sees a very small role for higher education. And I, I talked to um, the director for learning development at this bank, um, and she said in the past what would happen is if we wanted to, if we, if we wanted to kind of upskill our employees, we would send our student away, or send our employee away to do like a bachelor or a master course. And they said, we don't do this anymore because what was coming back wasn't exactly what we wanted. So now we work much more closely with the providers, but she said, what we do is we design the course, and then we go to the university and say, have you got someone who can provide this and this program for us uh, based on what we think we need? I was disappointed when I heard that because I think it should be the role of higher education to be much more actively involved in this. So this is, I think, both a challenge for employers to think much more about skills development instead of just complaining about skills gaps. But I think it's a, a challenge for higher education as well to try and put ourselves in the position of employers as well and try and think about what exactly do they need instead of saying, well, look, I've got you know 10 programs which I think will work. Which of those 10 are you going to take? Because that idea is, is also not to the flexibility I was talking about here. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I will keep my questions for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, one question concerning uh, learners' motivation to be included. Is oh, this only the pressure of the market? Or you, we should prepare people to really include it because they need to get new knowledge? Or how we, we can manage to, to get them actively inside? So, um, I've, so the question is about uh, yeah, motivation, I think, of, of learners. And particularly, you know, I focused a lot in my work in the past on, on what we sometimes call vulnerable groups or underrepresented groups. And we often find their motivation is also lacking. But it's lacking because they've had very bad experience in the education system. So part of the way we ensure the motivation is we recognize what these people have achieved so far and try and kind of pull them into the system. But the, 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 I think motivation and um, self-organization are both very key elements um, that you mentioned because the other point is we find that purely digital offers, also offers of most of the open universities, are mostly taken up by people who've already achieved higher education. So they already have this kind of skill to learning. So this is something we have to be providing in our school system, but it's something that we uh, also as higher education providers have to think about how we can support students more. And the problem of this kind of support until now has been it's not really scalable. So some of us might do these great things of you know, supporting individual students, but it's difficult to expand that then to all of your students. And there, I think, going forward, um, things like uh, you know, the application of uh, artificial intelligence into systems can help that to some extent. But it's a huge challenge. I totally agree with you. If you would have unlimited financial and human resources, what would be your blue sky project? <laughs> Unlimited, did you say? Yeah, well, exactly this point actually of how to, how to enable the kind of support that students need um, in a way that, it, it, that, that it's scalable. And I think, because for me that's the biggest challenge and that's why I mentioned already that thinking about 
support and advice as part of the didactical package is super important. And we've tended to think about that in using the term pedagogy when we think about schooling. But very often we don't think about it on a tertiary education level because we think, well, they're already adults, they should be able to do it. But particularly now, this is such an important uh, aspect. So it, it, um, I mentioned very briefly that I'm working uh, for Kiron, and we've got a platform which is to support, support refugees. We are going through exactly this transition point at the moment as well. So we had a lot of personal support for our individual students, but we've noticed it's not scalable, and therefore um, we can't um, uh, offer our services to more and more refugees, which is what we want. So this is, we need this technical solution for this. But I think the whole point is to think about what the big problem is first, and then think how technology can help. Uh, we tend to normally think the other way around. Oh, okay, now we've got AI, what can it do? I don't agree with that way, but that would be my blue sky thing. So give me the money, let's do it. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the lack of uh, flexibility of the universities in designing the study programs, but I argue that uh, things are a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah. Uh, uh, in Europe, and I know for a fact in Slovenia, we developed extremely complicated and sophisticated system of uh, evaluation of yes. the quality of the study programs. And you, if you add to that the mechanisms uh, run by the government and ministries of financing, basically <coughs> you uh, lock the creativity of the university and uh, hinder severely the flexibility when it comes to designing new programs. Yes. So I think uh, we should uh, think a little bit more broader picture in, in, in easing the design of new programs. I totally agree with you. Um, this is something I also mentioned uh, yesterday. My, so before I started working on this and also focusing on vulnerable groups, I was very focused on uh, the whole questions of governance and I've been doing it for the last 20 years. When we started all of this, this was called new public management and it was really to do with the fact of let's give universities more autonomy uh, in terms of uh, less dirigistic um, control directly from ministries and then kind of the other side was okay therefore we need quality assurance and um, you mentioned the funding as well we need for example performance based funding I think we're at a stage now where this has all gone too far and uh, we wrote a uh, we wrote an article um, myself and a, a colleague from Canada last year which was to do with we looked at the indicators being used for performance-based funding and asked ourselves, what is the implicit understanding of student success? And essentially what's happening is some of these systems, they're just stopping universities being more flexible, as you say. So one of the things is, if you have uh, performance-based funding, which is based on graduate numbers, which seems at first instance very, very uh, sensible, what you're saying is you're only going to pay um, that university f once a student has been through all the different uh, years of their study and finally finished their bachelor or their master's. If we then say, wait, but we would like, you, we would like uh, uh, students to be moving, for example, and do maybe some of their bachelor at one university and some at another, which is many of, many of our systems had this tradition in the past as well, this is, ter this is there's, there's no incentive there for universities to offer that kind of thing because they say, well, we're only going to be paid for graduates, so we want to keep the students as long as possible. So a lot of these governance methods that have been in, in, implemented until now have started to really reduce the flexibility of universities. So I agree with that. I think in terms of quality assurance, there is currently, in many countries, a new development to say, well, maybe we should really think about it. So I've been in discussions with some quality assurance agencies about this. Um, so I think there's a recognition of the problem. But I think, you know, we've had 20 years or so of um, this new public management. It's really the time that we rethink it now and think, how, do we, how can we allow universities to be more flexible? 
Thank you very much. Um, if there are no questions, uh, maybe you can contact Professor Orr through Twitter or email. For sure, you have one more Twitter followers from today. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, otherwise, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for your attention. You can, of course, ask me questions.